John F. Kennedy was assassinated on November 22, 1963, in Dallas, Texas. At the time, three former presidents were alive, along with 11 future presidents. 31st President Herbert Hoover was the earliest president still living. The day of the assassination, he sent a letter to Kennedy's widow, Jackie. Dear Mrs. Kennedy, I extend my deepest sympathy to you and your children. For this, the greatest loss that can come to you. May the knowledge that he gave his life for his country be a consolation to you. Earlier that year, Hoover had turned 89 and was suffering from multiple ailments. He didn't attend the funeral or the services at the Capitol, but instead was represented by his sons, Herbert Jr. and Allen. There were almost 30 years between the presidencies of Hoover and Kennedy. The two men represented different political eras. Nevertheless, the two had met and corresponded on numerous occasions. They first met when Kennedy's father, Joe, introduced his sons to the former president. When Kennedy received back surgery in 1954, Hoover sent then-Senator Kennedy a letter of encouragement. The two were even photographed together in the White House during Kennedy's presidency. Following the assassination, Hoover continued corresponding with Jackie Kennedy, and she even met with Hoover in 1964, just months prior to his death. Eleven months after the Kennedy assassination, Hoover died at 90 of natural causes. Franklin D. Roosevelt was long deceased by the time Kennedy took office. He died in 1945, only months into his fourth term due to numerous health issues at age 63. Roosevelt's vice president and successor, Harry S. Truman, was 79. After flying to Washington, he gave a statement to the press. I was very much shocked and hurt when I heard of the passing of the President of the United States. He was a good man and able president. He did a good job. And it's too bad that those things have to happen, particularly be some good-for-nothing fellow who didn't have anything else to do but to take the head of the state away from us. Eight days later, he was again asked about Kennedy. He'll have a good reputation when the history is written. He did a good job while he was there. I was very fond of him. I thought he was a fine man and a great president. In the 1960 Democratic Party primaries, Truman didn't support Kennedy and was upset when it became likely that Kennedy would be the candidate. He refused to attend the Democratic National Convention and even asked that Kennedy step out of the race. However, his problems weren't with John, but rather his father. Truman felt that Joe Kennedy used his wealth and influence to corrupt the democratic process. Quote, I was never afraid of Jack as president. I was worried about his paw. He also felt Kennedy was too inexperienced. Over the course of the Kennedy presidency, Truman believed he had learned a lot, but that the on-the-job training had hurt the country. He also believed the Kennedy presidency was too much about style over substance. Truman had once taken over for a deceased president and thus was asked if he had any advice for Kennedy's vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson. Truman declined to give any, simply saying, he's perfectly capable of doing the job. Don't worry about him. Dwight D. Eisenhower, Kennedy's immediate predecessor, was attending a United Nations meeting when he learned of the assassination. He spoke with reporters later that day. I share the sense of shock and dismay that the entire nation must feel at the despicable act that took the life of the nation's president. On the personal side, Mrs. Eisenhower and I share the grief that Mrs. Kennedy must now feel. When asked how he would console the American people, he said, In the face of such a terrible thing, I am sure the entire citizenry of the nation will join as one man in expressing not only their grief, but their indignation at this act and will stand faithfully behind the government. Seventy years old when he left office, there was a nearly full generation gap between him and the incoming 44-year-old Kennedy, the youngest man to ever be elected president, not to mention the contrast in Eisenhower's humble beginnings and the Kennedy family's immense wealth. He resented Kennedy and what he symbolized for the future of United States politics. He believed that television had created a cult of personality. Similarly, K. 
Kennedy didn't have much respect for Eisenhower. Nevertheless, the two would form a working relationship over Kennedy's presidency. In simplest terms, Kennedy came to appreciate the experience and intelligence of his predecessor, and Eisenhower, surprised by the seriousness with which Kennedy took the job, came to respect the young president. Kennedy would even hire some of Eisenhower's people and reorganized his staff based on the structure of Eisenhower's. He regularly spoke with Eisenhower and kept him, along with Hoover and Truman, updated on issues such as the Cuban Missile Crisis. Despite this, Eisenhower still had his hang-ups about the Kennedy presidency, mainly in its relationship with the public. To him, the incredible reaction of sadness to the death was a sign that Americans were sensationalizing individual leaders too much, and he feared that the wrong person could exploit this. John F. Kennedy was pronounced dead at 1 p.m., and about an hour and a half later, Lyndon B. Johnson was sworn into office as the 36th president. Johnson was just two cars behind Kennedy, and when the first shot rang out, he was pushed to the car floor and protected by a Secret Service agent. Afterwards, he boarded Air Force One. Wanting to show confidence to the panicked public, he didn't wait to get to Washington, and instead assumed office right there on the plane. Formally, Johnson showed much remorse and respect. In his Let Us Continue speech before Congress, he called Kennedy the greatest leader of our lifetime and made it clear that he intended to make good on Kennedy's legacy. He wrote letters to the Kennedy children and offered to allow Jackie and the children to stay at the White House longer. He'd stay in communication with Jackie for the following weeks. While he maintained a good image for the nation's sake, it was no secret that Kennedy and Johnson didn't get along. They not only represented different sides of the Democratic Party, but also of America. Johnson rose up from the poor South and clawed his way up the political ladder, becoming a ruthless and extremely effective politician. Kennedy had a comparatively unimpressive political career and had been propped up all his life by a wealthy family. Johnson had wanted to be president all his life, yet at 55, he was running mate to the 43-year-old Kennedy. Biographer Robert Caro paints an even more bitter picture, with an awkward and unmannered Johnson being belittled and humiliated by the elitist Kennedy family during his vice presidency. Caro even suggests that had Kennedy lived, he might have dumped Johnson as his running mate in 1964. Conspiracy theorists have ran with the idea of this conflict and even suggested that Johnson was in on a conspiracy to kill Kennedy and possibly even the mastermind. There has never been any evidence to prove this. Curiously, though, Johnson had his own questions about the assassination. In a 1969 interview, eight months after leaving office, Johnson admitted that he hadn't completely discounted the idea that there was a larger conspiracy behind Kennedy's killing. Kennedy's presidential rival, Richard Nixon, was actually in Dallas a day before the assassination. He was attending a business meeting with Pepsi-Cola officials, where he was actually criticizing many of Kennedy's policies. The day of the assassination, he'd flown back to New York and got the news while in a taxi. While at a stop, a pedestrian walked up to the taxi driver rambling that the president had been shot. When Nixon arrived at his residence, a friend described him as visibly shaken, possibly because of the loss of Kennedy, but probably more because of other fears. One such fear was that he could have also been a target, as Nixon's friend recalled him repeating how he was just in Dallas. Another fear was that the assassin might be right-wing. The following day, Nixon made a public statement, quote, the greatest tribute we could all pay to his memory would be in our everyday lives to do everything we possibly can do to reduce the hatred that drives men to such terrible deeds. On November 24th, he spoke again, recalling how when he first arrived in Washington in 1947 as a congressman, Kennedy was also a new congressman. He described him as a political opponent, but a personal friend. There was hospitality between the two, in 1952, Kennedy congratulated Nixon after he was nominated as vice president. In fact, 
The two spoke on the phone weeks prior to Kennedy's death. They were staying at the same hotel. Realizing they wouldn't get a chance to meet face to face, Kennedy gave Nixon a call just to say hi. The two certainly didn't always have kind things to say behind each other's backs, and certainly more so after the presidential battle. In Nixon's memoirs, published in 1978, he wrote, Kennedy and I were too different in background, outlook, and temperament to become close friends. But we were thrown together during our early careers, never had less than an amicable relationship. In those early years, we saw ourselves as political opponents, but not rivals. Nixon would also write a letter to Jackie, offering his condolences. Lee Harvey Oswald, who'd been arrested for Kennedy's assassination, was assassinated himself in police custody earlier on November 24th. Nixon said that Oswald deserved to die, but acknowledged that he had the right to a trial and called his killing despicable. Gerald Ford was 50 years old and had been a Michigan congressman for over a decade. Ford was in a car with his wife driving home from a parent-teacher conference when the news came over the radio. Seven days later, President Johnson appointed him, along with six other men, to the Warren Commission, which was tasked with investigating the assassination. Despite numerous conspiracy theories, the commission concluded that Oswald shot Kennedy, that he was the lone shooter, and that there was no larger conspiracy, a conclusion which Ford defended on numerous occasions, including a 1999 interview and in his book, A Presidential Legacy and the Warren Commission. Jimmy Carter was 39. Earlier that year, he had just begun his term in the Georgia State Senate and had never actually met Kennedy. Carter was working on his peanut farm. He'd just gotten off his tractor when some other farmers approached him with the news that the president was shot. He knelt in the field and said a prayer. Later, he learned from a customer that Kennedy was dead. He went outside to sit on the stairs and openly wept, the first time he'd done so since his father's death in 1953. In 2015, at the JFK Library, Carter said, he epitomized with his words and with his actions the finest aspects of my country. I guess I felt closer to him because he and I were both in the Navy. In 1963, Ronald Reagan had yet to begin his political career. In fact, he wasn't even finished with his television or movie roles. The 52-year-old actor was a known Democrat in 1960, yet he'd supported Republican Richard Nixon over Kennedy and in 1962 officially switched parties. The two never met, though in a 1967 letter, Reagan wrote that he considered Kennedy to be a, quote, much more perceptive and intelligent man than Johnson. In 1985, while serving as president, he spoke at a fundraiser for the JFK Library. While he acknowledged that he hadn't supported Kennedy in 1960, he nonetheless gave a speech full of praises. Just two months into his own presidency, Reagan was the victim of an assassination attempt, which he'd ultimately recover from. His wife Nancy noted, As my mind raced, I flashed to scenes of Parkland Memorial Hospital in Texas, and the day President Kennedy was shot. I had been driving down San Vicente Boulevard in Los Angeles when a bulletin came over the car radio. Now, more than 17 years later, I prayed that history would not be repeated, that Washington would not become another Dallas, that my husband would live. 39-year-old George Bush was already involved in business and politics, yet 26 years away from his own presidency. Bush had actually been in Dallas that morning, but had since traveled to Tyler, Texas, where he was giving a speech at a charity event. He was interrupted and given the news, to which he said, In view of the president's death, I consider it inappropriate to continue with a political speech at this time. The reaction of his wife, Barbara, was also recorded in a letter she wrote. She heard of the president's death over the radio. We are hoping that it is not some far-right nut but a commie nut. You understand that we know they are both nuts, but just hope that it is not a Texan and not an American at all. Bill Clinton was only 17 years old and 14 years away from holding his first public office. However, earlier that year, he had briefly met the president. Kennedy was speaking to members of Boys Nation, including Clinton. Clinton not only stood in the front row as Kennedy spoke, 
but also shook hands with the president. The brief interaction had a profound effect on him. Other Boys Nation members recalled him saying that he would have Kennedy's job one day. Clinton was in his fourth period calculus class when the teacher announced the president's death. There seems to be no information on how George W. Bush and Donald Trump reacted to the assassination. Both were 17 and in high school. Barack Obama was only two years old. In 2013, while serving as vice president to Barack Obama, Joe Biden gave an interview where he described vividly where he was when he got the news. He had just turned 21 two days prior and was on campus. Leaving class and walking down a hallway, he and his friends heard that Kennedy was shot. They got into Biden's car and listened to the radio. Quote, I remember it was almost like a frozen frame in time. Instead of everybody on campus running and saying, did you hear, there was these silent groups of people saying, can that be true? You'd see five students in a corner. It was almost like if you were to say it out loud, he was going to die. Half an hour later, or almost half an hour, whatever it was, it was, he's dead. And how can that be true? How is this possible in the United States of America? He also commented on the reverence Kennedy is given today and how it contrasts with his memory of the presidency. He recalled how close and divisive the election of 1960 was and how the nation wasn't unified under Kennedy's three years, but rather that the sense of unity came after the assassination. Linked in the description is a playlist containing related videos, such as the media statements given by Truman, Eisenhower, and Nixon, Lyndon B. Johnson's 1969 interview, and Ronald Reagan's speech for the JFK Library. If you enjoyed this video, watch this similar video on how other presidents reacted to Abraham Lincoln's death. You can also watch the playlist United States History Facts, which currently contains over 40 videos discussing the various presidents from United States history and their political and personal lives. You can support this channel by subscribing or making a donation on Patreon. Patreon link in the description below.